thank you very much for the invitation and thank you very much for attending. Um, to do a quick overview on evolutionary medicine, it's um, we've got Paul Edwald in 1980 and then Williams and Nessie in 1991 starting this movement. Um, when you think of the importance of ancestral medicine, it's surprising how little uptake it has had. And I like this quote here from Nessie, who's saying, medical schools have been slower to integrate evolutionary approaches because of the limitations on what can be added to existing medical curricula. Well, that's one way of looking at it but I think it goes a little bit deeper. So how is orthodontics evolutionary medicine? Well, we can ask the questions of genetics versus the environment. All disease has an element of both. We have always approached orthodontics from a genetic perspective. That's how it's treated. And yet there seems to be a large if not predominant, environmental component. And as such, this seems to be an environmental mismatch uh, with some skulls representing the considerable change in form from the hunter-gatherer to what we would look at a modern human. And most of those modern humans are modern humans with pretty straight usually 32 teeth. I don't think that re represents the modern human alive today. So a brief history of orthodontics. In the US, you had Edward Angle, who came up with the E-arch, which was the precursor of fixed braces, where he was trying to make teeth straight. And you have Rolf Frankel in, well, this was in East Germany initially, using a more complex brace here, where he's trying to use shields here to hold back the cheeks and lips to change the interaural environment. So if you're changing the balance between the soft tissues, you will align the teeth. The teeth will progressively align. However, Angle is saying the teeth are crooked Let's make them straight. So he's treating the symptoms rather than the causes of the problems. Whereas Frankel is trying to affect the causes of the problem. But of course, this is difficult, particularly for uncooperative teenagers. And what are parents paying for? They're paying for straight teeth. If you've got a business model, use fixed braces. And now, fixed braces, or the evolution from the E-arch, is almost universal. And you will struggle to find anyone using a Frankel appliance. And yet, one is treating the causes, the other is treating the symptoms. And I would go beyond these appliances, but these are a good representation. So the problem. We are lazy. No one wants to change. Now, I've been asking the question, why? It does not make me popular within my profession. But I really want to look at the evidence base with fresh eyes. And within my profession, we really don't understand the etiology of the problem. It's well known within my profession that there's no real understanding of why teeth are crooked. There's no real understanding of the epidemiology of this problem. I'm concerned that the diagnosis we make in my profession is literally a description of what's evidently seen. It's nothing to do with the cause. It's not a diagnosis in the truest sense of the word. We don't understand the pathology. There are far too many types of treatment. Try getting 
a diagnosis or an opinion from several different orthodontists. I would highly recommend it from anyone thinking of having treatment. And of course, there's no cure. We're recommending permanent retention. Now, when I look at the etiology, the cause, the factors that seem most pressing is the change in the masticatory effort and the change in oral posture. So we know that we've moved from a very hard, tough, low-calorie diet to a very soft, high-calorie diet. Of course, the wear on teeth are good indicators of that. Well, we know that muscle weakness diseases can lead to change in facial form. Uh, the individual, oh, going back, the individual here on the right has muscular dystrophy. Her teeth are in contact, but there's a gross deformation in form just because there's change in the muscle usage. Now, here is a template of a modern norm. And that brings another problem with an orthodontics, is the normative data stems from the middle of the last century, the 1900s. Now, if this is an evolutionary mismatch related to our lifestyle changes, normative data from the middle of the last century is going to confound our understanding of the disease process and is one of the problems. Of course, late onset muscle weakness can cause a problem. You know, he's already grown. So any change now cannot be genetic. Any unilateral muscle weakness on people who have already grown. Their genetics have played out. And changes, of course, in breathing or oral posture. I've gone through this before. I have many presentations that can be accessed on this. And effectively, if you have good muscle usage and you have your tongue on the roof of the mouth, you will have good growth patterns. And if you hang your mouth open with a low tongue posture and you have weak muscle usage or less muscle usage, your face will grow down and reform to protect your airway. This is not a new revelation. This seems to fit with all of the scientific evidence. And of course, as your face gets longer, your cross-sectional area is reduced, and you will make compensations to maintain an open airway. And I feel that genetics may play a role, but it's more likely to be evidence that is what the hard, so genetics is more likely to be secondary. That is what the hard evidence would support. And I've put forward the concept of craniofacial dystrophy, saying effectively, if the face is not the right shape, then it does not function correctly. And here's a, a, a group of problems that as general, we treat symptomatically and we don't understand the causes that seem to be related, the most important clearly is probably sleep apnea. But this is pretty well evidence-based. I would struggle to prove this, but you couldn't disprove it. And I worry the prove it mentality has once again become too prevalent in medicine Now, I want to put some cases in to make sort of a realistic understanding of what we're trying to do. Here's, here's a boy with, I worked hard with. And I've overlaid his photographs so you can understand the type of changes we're trying to get here. Now, that was five years of hard work. His teeth are not perfectly straight. I'm not going to pass a board exam. Orthodontists would look at this and say, well, that's not a very good job. But he's straightened his own teeth. He's done it. And if he's done it, they're likely to stay straight. It's also been economic disaster 
five years of treatment, well, it's difficult to charge people and the amount of time I spend with people. So, who makes money? The liposurgeon or the dietitian? And this is one of the crux problems, because who's making the real health gain? Because one of them's driving a Ferrari, the other one's driving a bicycle. One of them's on the committee meetings at the hospital, the other one probably doesn't know when the meetings are going to happen. And that's one of the crux problems with how our healthcare system has played out. Fixing things makes money. Now, I'm also concerned with what we refer to within orthodontics as unfavorable facial growth. Well, it's considered that this is genetic. It's considered that orthodontic problems are genetic. Yet, what I see when I look at any controlled study, where they're controls and where they're orthodontically treated samples, the facial length always increases in the orthodontically treated samples. So an element of this always happens. So there always is some downswing in facial form from affecting people, from trying to move the teeth straight, making the teeth straight. And that worries me, because it worries me about the health effects that could happen. My father raised his fears in a program in the UK called Dispatches in 1998, and has suffered for the consequences of raising his fears. He never had any form of intellectual dialogue on his fears. Now I also wonder about other iatrogenic effects from trying to move teeth, such as root resorption. You see the tips of these teeth have been affected. And of course, we are asking people to wear retainers for the rest of their lives. So we're holding the teeth straight because the causes haven't been affected. And because the causes haven't been affected, teeth still tend to move. And I worry about holding teeth out of their balance zone. Because you can hold the teeth out of the balance zone, you can't hold the bone, the gums, and the supporting tissue out of the balance zone. And in modern societies, we tend to head south as we get older. I don't think this happened to our ancestors, but it does now. And if you're going to head south, but you're going to hold your teeth in a predetermined position, eventually, the teeth are going to start bulging out of the bone, and you will lose the roots. You'll lose the bone around the teeth. And if you are predisposed to gum disease, that's going to be a catastrophe. I also see many people who don't have teeth extracted, who have their arches widened, and I think they're going to be even more susceptible. But that cohort have not run through the system yet. Remember, we've only been doing mass orthodontics for about 35 years. We have yet to see the long-term effects of all of this. And of course, then there is relapse. You don't wear your retainer, it's going to relapse. This individual is missing his wisdom teeth, he's missing a premolar, and the teeth are crowded again. You know, that's eight teeth down, and you've got crowding. And what's the solution? Take some more teeth out? Remember, all our ancestors had all of their teeth, and usually a good five to ten millimeters behind the wisdom teeth. They were dramatically different skull forms than most people alive today. It's interesting, walking around the campus here, I see so many people with smiles that I know don't match their faces. And I'm sure they're wearing retainers every night, but they're holding their teeth out of their balance zone, and they have no idea what potential damage that could cause or what they could do about it. They just don't have this knowledge, this information. So this is what I showed you earlier on. I won't go into the details. I refer to it as an MFO. It's how I overlay faces so I get a better understanding. You can't do x-rays all the time, and I think 
I worry about the value of x-rays. Photographs, I think, are more accurate. And so flicking through her facial forms, I think we've got a reasonable change in her growth pattern over time. But that has taken me a long time. It was a very involved treatment. You know, it's taken me 10 years of my time on with her. You know, I can't charge a commensurate fee for the time it takes me to do that. But I think the health gains I added her to her are large. It's more than just straight teeth. But there are certain scientific blockages that I think I see in the system. I think that many people are looking at what I'm doing and it's saying we're just making pretty faces. You know, we're not doing health. This is more in the region of plastic surgery. You know, medicine should be about making people healthier, not more beautiful. And yet, you know, what is beauty? Saying that beauty, our appreciation of beauty, is influenced by what we perceive as healthy. And in many ways, I believe I'm making people healthy. It's perceived as beauty. And it's interesting that there are no known or recognized health benefits that I know of from orthodontics, apart from aesthetic improvement. So, in a way, aesthetic improvement of the face or or aesthetic improvement of the teeth is the focus of what I do or conventional orthodontics. Second, it's emotive. Talking about anyone's face is an emotive issue. People often don't want to talk about it. And of course, we've got business models and profit. Making teeth straight has become a very effective business model. Of course, that discussion of the genes or the environment means that if it's genetic, I'm wrong. And if it's predominantly the environment, then modern orthodontics may be wrong. It's not an additive idea. It's an either-or idea. So it's a competitive process. I'm right or they're right. We, it's going to be difficult for both people to be right. And then the legacy. If the way we've been approaching malocclusion, crooked teeth, has been wrong, well, I would imagine many of you have had treatment. What about it? What are we going to do about that? How do we redress that? People have to admit they're wrong. People don't like doing that. And of course, also, it's intuitively impossible most people think that it's just impossible to change a facial form. However much evidence I give people, they don't want to hear it. And I think often it's because people want this preordained belief. We've latched onto it. You know, they don't want to understand that their facial form isn't correct. It may lead to serious health issues that could even shorten their lives, and it's their fault. Less the modern environment as well, probably a little bit of your parents, but it largely it's your own fault. It's not a good message. People don't want to hear that. So, now, what are we going to do? Well, what am I going to do? So I've watched my father's reputation destroyed now, after this dispatches program in 1998. He raised his concerns. He said that he thought that a certain percentage, up to 20 or 30 percent of children who are having orthodontics, have notable facial damage. He's never had any scientific engagement on to whether he was right or wrong. But he was largely condemned. I remember going to a lecture given by the head of the academic program, so the guy who decides what goes in the program, 
at the big London university that qualifies 25% of the students in the UK. He gave a controversial lecture. At the end of the lecture, I went up and I said, you know, do you have some evidence for some of these things you want to say? Of course, what he wanted to respond to me, saying that, well, there's very little evidence for anything in dentistry. But he decided to make a little quib. And so the quib he said was, well, there's no evidence that just to prove that John Mew's wrong. And I said, you know, that's my father. And he said, oh, yes, yes, I know. I think it will clear you didn't know, because you wouldn't have said it if you knew. But in his mind, my father was the definition within dentistry of poor science. That was it. There was no higher benchmark than my father for bad science. And there wasn't even the evidence to show that he was wrong, so there's very little evidence within orthodontics or dentistry, dentistry as a whole. Now, I've never had any deep engagement with any orthodontist ever, not even when I was training. As soon as I get into deep water, people, you know, they want to swatch off, they don't want to engage with me, and I have an outstanding offer. So anyone watching this who thinks that I may be telling incorrect evidence, have an engagement with me. Sit down, let's chew the fat on orthodontics. Now, I've written to all of the orthodontic teaching schools in the UK twice. Um, we had a response from Dundee for a period, and then that didn't go anywhere. I've then, you know, I've had now writing to my local school, which is this large school that qualifies 25% of the students in the UK. It, it, it seems to go nowhere. And I'm, you know, we seem to be, as the, the professor said, speaking different languages. All I want is them to analyze my cases, look at, do a cohort with me, help me get some research going. Then I've, extend, I've lectured extensively, including clearly ancestral health symposium. And it's you know, always interesting looking at some of the responses. I remember after the symposium in Boston, someone said, fascinating, fascinating, but I'll still go with diet. That, that's, that's solid. You know, I know that the consistency of the diet is solid science. And I'm thinking, I don't see any hard evidence for the consistency of the diet. I would love to see some. It would be simple for me to recommend supplements. And yet, there's such good evidence to support what I'm saying and craniofacial dystrophy. So, in 2009, I published an editorial, The Black Swan, in the BDJ, challenging my profession to a debate on the etiology. I've engaged with the British Orthodontic Society. I've had numerous emails with them. I've wrote extensively to three chairs of the General Dental Council, the, the board certifying body within the UK. I've written to my member of parliament, who I also met, I've written extensively to the Council of Healthcare Regulatory Excellence, um, the All-Party Dental Committee, the Minister of Health. I've had questions asked in the House of Lords, a little bit like your Senate. And I've published extensively and, and engaged in letters in the British Dental Journal, you know, the main journal of dentistry in the UK. And then I published my opinion piece, Craniofacial Dystrophy, as I mentioned, in the BDJ in 2014. So from 2009 to 2014, I've been a right royal pain in the ass. I've been asking simple questions. Why are teeth crooked? My profession doesn't know. We're treating a large percentage of the population. We need to have debate. You know, we had a debate by the General Dental Council. I think it was in 1936. It's time for another one. Then, of course, social media arrives. And also, I'm trying to set a clinic up. So we engage with social media, and we do surprisingly well. I mean, this is now one of the major orthodontic Facebook pages where we engage with people and we talk. 
Then I had some interesting advice on YouTube to make videos on lots of different subjects because that would bring people in. But I had this deep urge to share my knowledge, to help people. And especially when, when what you're doing is being prevented, it's really quite difficult. You know, I want to say these things. I want to tell people how they can easily make themselves better. It's very difficult for me to see someone sitting there with their mouth open and not say, look, stand up, improve your posture, chew some gum. Um, and also, you know, I've, 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 I'm treating cases, and I can see the benefit of what I'm doing. I mean, you know, this girl was told um, no option but surgery. She's got what we refer to as a class three. Now she's only halfway through. I saw her the other day. She is looking significantly better than this. This girl was told no option but surgery. There's a mark in the teeth so you can see where it's going. Now, I'm not happy with that result. I want to make her look a lot better because I know if she looks better, she is healthier. Now, then this was very strange. I've, I've gone viral. Now, I, I was asked to give this presentation. It was to young men. And sometime after this, I, one of my guys working for me said that there was a discussion on something called slut hate. And I, and I engaged and discussed this thing with these guys. And it seemed to then just take off virally. And we got this advent of mewing. And I see people out there who are buying into what I'm saying. They're really working hard. and. They're changing their facial form. They're posting these pictures, and there's this whole community of mewers, which is kind of not what I was expecting. But I guess, you know, what I'm saying, it's really only of interest to people with faces. And I guess that's quite a lot of people. But, you know, I say that, as I say, often say to people, you know, I've got, I've got a strong jaw. Now, I've got strong muscles. And it would seem that the two are related. How do you get strong muscles? You chew. If you want a good jaw and a strong face, chew. Use your system. Use it or lose it. But of course, then we have the Empire Strikes Back. So the British Orthodontic Society, who refused to engage with me on any form of debate on the etiology, has then reported me to the General Dental Council on a particular video. They said, <coughs> We've reported you in the highest manner possible. Then, <clears throat> if you don't take the videos down, we'll throw you out from British Orthodontic Society. And I said, why? What's wrong with the video? To which they wouldn't tell me. Six months, no details. You know, where's my freedom of speech in all of this? Then, clearly, the case reaches the General Dental Council. My lawyers get involved, and then they need to give some detail. You know, a lawyer's letter is very good for bringing some action. So they um, go through my videos and find out uh, <clears throat> lots of little elements where they think I've said things that don't fit with the orthodox view, the real politic of modern orthodontics. And they make a list of them. They give them to the General Dental Council. And who are the General Dental Council going to believe? I believe me or the unanimous decision by a list of bigwigs and professors. So up to date, I've had an interim orders committee hearing. So I have had to go to a meeting where they decided whether I was a current danger and threat. So after the initial findings, they have to see if I'm currently dangerous. They decided I wasn't, luckily. Then we've got a couple of patients who have become involved. I won't go into that in great detail, but I think they want to move this away from a philosophical argument into a patient argument, because it's a more emotive. But my concern is, in the next 12 to 18 months, I've got to do something out the back box, or I will lose my license. I will lose my livelihood, and I'll lose my practice. 
When I go in front of this court with the General Dental Council, I will rely on experts. There are no experts that are going to support me, I know. With the expert against has already laid his case, and I'm as guilty as charged for the comments I've made. The experts carry weight. My opinion doesn't carry weight. Now, I know the expert supporting me thinks I'm guilty as charged. So I'm going to be guilty as charged. And this is based on a house of cards of information. <clears throat> and I chose this picture because the top of this house of cards looks solid. And unless I can challenge the very foundations, the very roots upon which this hard tabletop is made, I go down. I'll lose my license. There's no question. This is a slow motion car crash. Now, <clears throat> a clinical update. I move forward. I'm trying to take on older patients because the older the patients I can do, the more I can demonstrate I'm getting changes that aren't just genetic. I'm trying to use heat maps and 3D scanning to try and really look in depth of what I'm doing. And I can see, you can probably see this heat map well illustrates what the change has gone. But I think that what I'm doing is a spearhead argument for evolutionary medicine. Orthodontics affects nearly all families in the Western world. It's one of the largest, it's a significant household cost. And one of the most significant symptoms, I believe, OSA, obstructive sleep apnea, is probably shortening the lives of most 10% of people in America by about 10 years. So it's a significant problem. And I'm making a, the base level argument is robust. The argument is sound, but it's probably preventable. And that is my biggest annoyance. Our ancestors didn't have this. Other mammals don't have this. It should be preventable. So please go to this site, Prevent Crooked Teeth. Your support here would be welcome. But also, I ask the movement, the ancestral health movement, to support me in my quest for the scientific process and to support me before my career is destroyed for following the truth, for my quest for the science, the answers. This is really happening. This is the stuff sort of books are written about or movies are made on. And it's happening right now in front of your eyes. And I look to the ancestral health movement to support me as a spearhead movement for the ancestral health movement. Thank you very much. <laughs> By the way, please, sharing this video would help. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. I just think what you're doing is incredible, and I hope that people uh, step up to support it. Um, if you want to take a few minutes of questions, we can yeah, probably we take can a couple. Yeah, we can do a few minutes. Yeah, we'll take a few minutes. Hi, Mike. That was amazing. This is probably more of a kind of a statement as well as a question. So in medicine, there's there's functional medicine. Is there's no such thing as functional dentistry where you're looking more at root cause of things? I think terms are important. Now, a lot of people use what is referred to as functional appliances. And functional appliances are a little step in the direction I'm in. But if they're one meter towards me, they're still nine meters away from me. There's still a huge difference between what we refer to as functional appliances and what I do. And I think I'm often labeled as replying functional appliances. And the evidence for functional appliances, which I believe I agree is quite poor, is often labeled on me as well. And I think the trouble is functional movement has sort of latched on to functional appliances. Gotcha. Okay, well, I think what you're doing is wonderful, and I think there is, I see science. They might not see it, but you have... Uh, well, yeah, I'm trying. Yeah. But, you know, you need to talk to people who are going to talk to you. Yes. 
Okay. If people don't engage, the biggest problem in science is just the lack of engagement. If people don't engage in science, it goes nowhere. And it's too easy not to engage. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. That was my initial question, too, but I'll ask a different one now. Uh, you're saying that we can increase or get a better jaw, more defined jaw, and a bigger chin based on the work you're doing to kind of bring it forward. Is that the mewing movement? Can you do that at home? Or is that something somebody has to work with you one-on-one -on -one with? No, you can do it at home. What I often say to anyone engaging with treatment with me, so I said that if I could plug in to your brain, a little bit like they did in the film The Matrix, and I could reset your parameters, that is all I would have to do. Anyone has the potential. The best appliance is your tongue. You've got one. Improve your posture and function, and you'll improve the structure. We know that. I mean, the, all the evidence suggests that. It's just people don't want the conclusions. They don't want to hear it. And it defies convention. You know, we believe the face we've got is, is us. What's that image on your passport, your identity, that defines who you are? It's your face. What's that thing that looks back at you from any mirror? It's your face. It is you. And to suggest that you, your face, is not correct, it's just so alien to people. It's just a very difficult thing to understand. But when people understand this, this will be one of the biggest stories ever. Ever. Thank you. Yeah, Mike. Uh, what, to what extent does the orthodoxy have a coherent argument or set of arguments in, in, uh, in, that would, that, to the, which you would have to uh, like defeat in, on in an open dialogue, is that going to happen? Well, it's just interesting. You know, it's, it's a sort of real politic answer. It just, it seems to evolve slowly over time. And evolved to, it's almost like the, the argument is fashionable. I've watched the argument change over time. And there seems to be a response to nearly every question given that sounds very reasonable. And... You know, these, these are some very bright people who are just not willing to look underneath the carpet. And they're building everything on top of these assumptions and trying to square every circle and being really quite effective at it. Again, when I engage with anyone, I, kn I know the holes. You know, I know how to drive a London bus through most arguments, but someone has to engage with you. And it's very easy to make, you know, quick sound bites that sound impressive. It's you, to get a scientific answer, you really need to get down to the root, the base evidence, and have an impassioned discussion, um, rather than a passionate discussion that happens too often. I mean, what would be the kind of thing that, uh, that someone from the orthodoxy would say in response to you? Would they say that the, the, the dental misalignment is part of the normal very Variation in the population? Yes. The, 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 one of the common concepts at the moment is that malocclusion is a normal vari a variation around the norm. So everyone has slightly crooked teeth in one direction or another direction, and it's a variation around the norm. But that just doesn't fit with this gross change we've had from our ancestral form to our modern form. There's been huge changes. Look at skulls from in any in museum, and they look just dramatically different. All our ancestors look dramatically different. You know, you see someone walking out the Serengeti, someone walking out the Brazilian rainforest, someone walking out the um, Australian outback, and they all stand up with beautiful posture. They've all got beautiful facial form. Clearly, I'm using this term beauty again, this health and beauty. And they've got 32 perfectly straight teeth, a good space behind those teeth. All of them always, unless they have a specific problem, unless they're not healthy. And that is just so different from what we see in modern society now. And the fact that we took the profession has taken these x-rays, this normative data, in the middle of the 20th century, and against that data we're treating patients, it seems it's going to confound how you think. And from that 
thought pattern, you could come to conclusion that this is a variation around the norm. But that argument then doesn't stack up. The other thing they would say to me is I have no evidence. Clearly, I don't have lots of randomized clinical controlled trials. Well, I am one individual. But I pay my taxes. My patients pay their taxes. The salaried researchers in my local area are not even talking to me. They're not even listening to my concerns. They're not doing their job of helping me to do the research that would validate them. I mean, how many MSCs have happened in the last 10 years in London by orthodontists? Could one of them not have been on what I'm doing? It's all being paid for by the state. We have a socialized healthcare system that's even paying for a good chunk of the orthodontic therapy. If I'm right, if there's any evidence to what I'm saying is correct, this would make a major change to healthcare costs. A major change. This has a big impact on OSA. Well, where's the benefit there? We need, all I'm asking for, the scientific process. I say, don't believe a word I say, but believe in my desire and my right to have a debate on the etiology of malocclusion, some form of scientific engagement. I just want a level playing field. I'm asking for no more. So that we can have science. So we can have a understanding of the baseline facts. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm primarily an exercise physiologist, work as a trainer also. And based on some stuff from Ron Horoska, PRI, and other people, I've noticed a big association between uh, cranial facial structure and just overall movement quality. Uh, so my questions are twofold, if you've seen similar, and then would the maybe fitness field be sort of a backdoor area into more what you're looking at instead of kind of going around maybe the profession you started in? I know I, it's a little bit of a yeah, odd area. Yeah, I think what, um, what I see is people with this, okay. Sorry, but most people in this room have got distorted craniofacial form. When I walk down a high street anywhere, I see car crash, car crash, car crash. Sorry, it, it, it's, it, I see disasters everywhere. And once you really understand what I'm saying, your eyes become opened and you see this disaster going on in front of you. You see it in your children. You see it in your friends. Now, as the space for the tongue becomes limited and the airway space becomes a vital space, as I call it, people gradually gain a more forward head posture, and that can really affect their ability to um, engage in sports and activities. Now, as far as going around the profession, I think th that's a good way. I think I would love to bring in people from a sports field and physiotherapy field into my clinic. And I would, you know, I, I'm only getting going. That, that facial form I'm going to show of that adult or those kids, I'm only touching the surface. I know I could do so much more. I, I can know the people. I know the techniques I could bring in. I will hopefully get there. But it's, you know, I can't live off less. I can't work any harder. There's a limit to this. And that's where I need to come to events like this. This is why I want, you know, benefactors. I want engagement in science. Because this is the way forward, the scientific process. You know, I have, a, I have a demonstration of a scientific process here. The scientific process has brought us great gains. And some areas like this, they use it well. Why can't we use it well in medicine all the time? We know it's not happening. We know that evolutionary medicine could provide so many great gains. But it means, A, people have to change their lifestyles. But also, we have to change bits of modern medicine. And probably the profit motive doesn't go in that direction. Michael. Mike, I just want to console you with the following bit of pessimism, which is that orthodoxies hate science. They hate it in 1600 with Copernicus and Bruno and Galileo. They hated it all through the 19th century when Pasteur was arguing for the germ theory of disease. And now they hate evolutionary medicine. It stands in the way of their profits, their power, 
and their ideology. Sorry. That's okay. Well, I, I, I recognize I'm the most hated person in orthodontics on planet Earth. Sorry, do you have a question? And then we should round up. Thank you. Yeah, I just I agree with him because um, going after that, but um, basically, thank you for your work. I recently had a nephew, and now I'm making sure that he's chewing uh, instead of having baby food. So thank you for your work. Um, so you said before that your goal is to eliminate your business and to not um, to not need to do orthotropics to have people yeah. do it themselves. Yeah. Um, and you're or not getting yeah you're not orthodontics and you're not getting support from the orthodontic community and very likely you might lose your license just like you said. But I think that the support you're getting from the online community or just people that hear your message that are not so um, tied up with uh, they don't have to. They didn't have to pay for orthodontic school and lose their proper, uh, probably their livelihood, so they're not as attached to it. So I think that, yeah, going online is the best, is a great way to go. But I have a question for you. If you are going to create like a teaching curriculum or something for um, people that want to learn how to spread it, because, for example, for myofunctional therapy, you have to go to dent, uh, dentist school, dentistry school for four years, um, get in debt for that, it's a lot of money, and then um, then you get to be a myofunctional therapist. And especially in our society, if you have the certifications, people believe you and to become a myofunctional therapist. Like, do you, are, you, are you thinking of having any sort of curriculum that's stamped by you? Because I don't really care about going to dentist school. I want to go and learn what you're teaching. I, I have a personal dislike of credentialism mm -hmm. and this tendency towards protectionism and placing paywalls. One of my biggest dislikes is the fact that I see so many professorial types or the, you know, the Mr. Barbady Barbady who's written the book, he's got lots of qualifications, but he is useless. People go to see him because he's of his reputation. They're willing to pay over the odds to see him because he's Mr. Barbady Barbady and they're being screwed over. That is a particular dislike of mine. I would like to see a system where we pay people for results, for what they achieve, and it is something I would like to engineer, and I would like to lower the academic requirements for entry and increase an ability-based, result-driven Certification. You know, it, it works very well for my plumber. <laughs> Why can't it work for my doctors? Okay, so that's in the works. <laughs> I know you that, have a that, that, That's on the list. <laughs> yeah, that's on the long list. But I, I, I hope to get there. You know, I, I want to change the world. I've got to go do or die, haven't I? And if I don't think out the box, if I just continue in a straight line as I'm going, I'm history. And it, it, it's, 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 as I said, it's a slow motion car crash. You know where it's going to go. Because when I go into, if I walk into the General Dental Council court, which I will have to at some point, if I go in with two experts who think I'm clearly wrong, one thinks I'm very wrong, one's trying to find reasons to believe me because he's being paid by my insurers, well, I'm, I'm a dead man. You know, and yet, I believe I'm doing the scientifically proven thing. I'm doing the best for my patients. I'm struggling to survive economically to provide this therapy for my trip patients. And yet, I'll be struck off for doing so. Yeah, but I say don't even, well, I wouldn't even go with, like, the orthodontist or even try to appeal to them because, you know, other... Low, like it's not main or it has become mainstream fitness like Pilates yoga you don't get insurance for going to those things but it becomes so big because the people have seen the results and I think that's what's going to happen well yeah but I, I need I need by law I need to be registered to treat people and that law can be used against me thank you very much so do you want to, we've got thank, time for thank one you, more Mike. question thank you Mike we're uh, it's after five already um, so I we're going to cut that, sorry.
yeah, we, I will talk uh, later. Anyway, listen, so thank you very much you be, to a great audience. Will you be hanging around or at the dinner for people who want to ask more? Sorry, are you going to speak up, sir? Will you be either here or at the dinner later? Or I'll be at the dinner later. I, mean, I, I wanted to spend, it was very thankful that they put this presentation on the first day because I will spend the rest of the conference here. And, you know, I appeal to you for ideas, for support, for help. So I said, if anyone watches this video, you know, share it. Tell people what's happening. Ask questions. You know, have more than one consultation if you go to see an orthodontist. Be sensible. Think. And thank you very much.